All right, so this is a busy week. Actually, it's going to be busy until Thanksgiving for us. Um, you've just turned in Homework 5A, and on Thursday, Homework 5B is due. Homework 5B is a mix of easy problems, which you could probably do in your sleep, and some harder problems that I'm going to tell you a lot about today, giving you some key ideas. So that's due in class on Thursday, and then a week from today, we're going to have Quiz 3, which is our... Uh, Final quiz for the semester. Any questions related to the schedule? The reason why we've got two assignments back to back is um, in the past I used to have just one assignment for chapter five and it was all due at the same time and so you know the alternative to having one due today and one due on Thursday would be to have everything you did already and these next problems due on Thursday which is what I did uh, for the first several years that I was here, but I learned that that was a bit much and so I broke it up. All right, well we're going to be talking about reservoirs, nozzles, and cavitation today, some applications of continuity relationship. So the, uh, the idea here is combining Q equals VA essentially, or the Reynolds transport theorem that we were talking about previously, with some other principles. Let me dim the lights so that you can see some of these uh, key ideas in problem 572. Here's the picture from that problem. And um, what it shows is that there is flow going in and flow going out of a closed tank where there's no capacity for storage. All right. Um, now this is kind of a, a unique situation because the fluid that's coming in isn't water. It's two different fluids that are coming in, as a matter of fact. Uh, we don't know what they are. We don't necessarily need to know. But the unit weights are provided. You see here at A, there's a volumetric flow rate that's defined along with the uh, specific gravity. And at B, also a volumetric flow is given and a specific gravity. And then there is uh, stuff coming out at C. What they want you to know, they want you to calculate at C, which is the outflow, what is the mass flow rate, what is the average velocity, and what's the specific gravity of that mixture. Now, um, it's usually true in a situation like this that the flow in and the flow out would be equal. You know, Q in equals Q out. But in this case, that's not true. Uh, in this case, what we have is that the mass flow is conserved, but the volumetric flow may not necessarily be conserved. And so what we can always rely on is, first of all, our definition of mass flow rate, that the mass flow rate is the density times the volumetric flow rate. That'll never lead us astray. We also know that we can calculate the density of a fluid with this formula. This is using the specific gravity Multiplying that by the ratio, or by the, the density of water will tell us the density of some fluid. So um, you can use this middle formula to find the density of everything that's coming in. And of course, Q equals VA. So ultimately, this is a, here's the simplified version of the Reynolds transport theorem that we apply when we say that there's no reaction happening inside of the control volume. And this is one of those cases. Although there's mixing of two substances, it's, there's no chemical reaction that we need to be worried about. Um, now here, there's no accumulation inside of the control volume. So the left-hand term here, the mass of control volume with respect to time, there's no change of mass in the control volume, so N equals out. And uh, they've given you all the information you need to know to define the N at A and the N at B. And so then what you have to do is find the, uh, the flow out in terms of the mass flow rate. Once you know that, you can find the, uh, the velocity and the specific gravity. Okay, so any questions about these uh, ideas for problem 572? Okay. Let's uh, remind ourselves what we were doing with reservoirs previously. You remember we were talking about Oahe Dam, Oahe Reservoir, and we worked that problem in um, 
traditional units where you had to know how many square feet are in an acre. Do you remember what that conversion factor was? 43,560, of course, right? One acre is 43,560 square feet, okay? In this problem, we're using traditional units, I'm sorry, SI units, which um, are usually a lot easier, but I think there's going to be one thing in here that's unfamiliar to you, and that's the area, me uh, area measurement of a hectare. Anybody know what a hectare is? No. Uh, one hectare is 100 meters by 100 meters. So it's 10,000 meters squared. That's easy enough, right? And that's a little bit more reasonable than 43,560 at least. Okay, so here what we know is the at a certain time the surface area of the reservoir, that's given as 10,360. So that's the area in hectares of the reservoir. The flow rate in is given as 11,330, the flow rate out. So what we're going to have to do is apply the Reynolds transport theorem here and say, comparing in and out, does that mean that there is a positive accumulation or a negative accumulation? I guess it's already sort of implied that it's positive because it says here that there is a, uh, a Q rise that we need to find through subtracting the in versus the out. And then translate, translate that into the velocity that the fluid is rising. I think that was maybe the, uh, the idea that was um, the most unfamiliar when we were talking about reservoirs in the past. And so I'd like to reinforce that. Calculate the velocity of the water rising in terms of meters per hour. All right, since this is just water coming in and water coming out, I solved it on a volumetric basis, but you can solve it on a mass basis because uh, you'll get the same answer either way. We just look at the flow rate in versus the flow rate out, and it's because there's more coming in than going out that water is accumulating inside of the reservoir. Um, the rate of accumulation which I'm calling Q rise, is 4,250 cubic meters per second when we look at the difference between the in and the out. Now, how quickly the water level is rising depends on the surface area. If this lake had a very uh, small surface area, then it would be rising quickly. For example, if the lake had a surface area of only one square meter, then it would be the water level would be rising at a rate of 4,250 meters per second. That's if the lake is one meter. Of course, you know, lakes, it wouldn't be a lake if it had a surface area of one square meter. So it, it's much larger than that. Um, we can convert from hectares to square meters. It's uh, 1.04 times 10 to the eighth meters squared. And then the uh, the velocity of the rise will work out to 0.148 meters per hour when we convert it from meters per second into meters per hour. The, uh, the key nugget of information here that I hope you'll begin to uh, feel really comfortable with is this idea that the velocity of the rise is the net flow rate, which I'm calling Q rise here. I called it that. It's, it's just the difference between the in and the out. So the net flow rate divided by the surface area. And there was a part of the problem statement that I want to ask you about, where it said, at this time and uh, at a certain instant in time. Why do you suppose it mentioned that idea of, like, right now, two separate parts in the problem statement? OK. Let's assume that it is. Good point. Qn could be variable. You know, if it's raining upstream in the watershed, the flow rate in um, isn't governed in the same way that the outflow is. We can govern the outflow with the valve. 
But let's just say that maybe the inflow was steady. I'd still put that in at an instant in time. Stuart? Exactly right. Look at the shape of this uh, reservoir. If the water level is low, it has a different surface area than, than when the uh, water level is high. And uh, in fact, this diagram is maybe a little bit um, misleading because in most cases, as the water level goes up, the surface area gets larger at an increasing rate. You know, the taper of the, this bottom of the lake, the bathymetry as they call it, what, the geometry of underneath the water surface, Ordinarily, it gets um, larger and larger area as the water level goes up. And so maybe, you know, if you have the lake one foot deeper, you could double the surface area. And so um, that's because more land becomes inundated with the, uh, with the flooding. Now, not to go into too much detail about that, but I did want to point out why I uh, emphasized the time issue. It could be the variable inflow, but it, in this case, I meant it just to emphasize the fact that the surface area is only valid right now, and the, uh, the velocity that we calculated for, the velocity may be uh, slowing down as the surface area gets larger. Even if the flow rates were the same, it, the water level would be increasing at a slower and slower rate as more land got flooded by the incoming flow. Any questions related to the example? All right. Uh, DM versus DT. So if you're looking at the mass accumulation, is, is that what you're asking? Yeah, the, uh, the formula, this formula, if you were going to solve it by the mass approach, you would be finding how many kilograms of water are accumulated in the lake over time. And so that would be the, the additional mass. And so then you'd need to divide by the density to find out the uh, additional volume. So you'd, you'd have to convert it to a volume step. Mm, you'll always have to account for the density of the fluid. But, you know, here's an example of where the volumetric method wouldn't be able to tell you what you need, so you'd have to rely on mass flow. Sometimes, I guess the way I'd put it is, sometimes the volumetric method is sufficient, you know, where it's water in and water out. You don't necessarily have to keep track of it on a mass basis. And sometimes the mass basis is necessary. All right. Well, uh, we've talked about the orifice equation on a few different uh, occasions, and you've seen it in the lab, that the velocity of water coming out of an orifice is higher when the elevation of water gets deeper and deeper. You saw when we turned on the bench in the lab that there was just a very small stream coming out, but as it got deeper and deeper, the jet was, uh, was protruding further because the velocity at the outflow was greater. And it's the origin of V equals the square root of 2GH. That's from Bernoulli's equation. We've looked at the derivation of that a couple of times. Well, um, this is another situation where conditions are not necessarily the same as the tank continues to empty. And so what we're going to look at is a way for predicting how long it's going to take for the water level to fall a certain distance. And we're going to be doing that by combining together the idea of the orifice equation along with Reynolds transport theorem, which is just that we have a control volume. There's, the system is inside the control volume, and we're looking at the flow in and the flow out. In a case like this, it's simplified because there's no flow in to the control volume. There's only a flow out from the control volume. And it's at this location that for purposes of this example, we're calling it location one. That's just the, the orifice where the water is coming out. All right, so here we have this orifice. And um, the flow out, the volumetric flow out, the velocity here, and the area will tell us the Q out. 
And uh, Reynolds transport theorem tells us that if a certain flow rate is coming out, then that's the same rate that water is being lost inside of the storage. So the area of the tank here multiplied by dH dt tells us the rate that water is leaving the tank. So dH dt is the velocity that the water is falling. And the area of the tank, of course, when multiplied by a velocity, will give us cubic meters per second or a volume per time. See, the rate out is equal to the rate of storage loss. Now, the orifice equation, if we substitute that in to V1, let's step through the implications of that. So here is V1 times A1, which is just our outflow. Outflow is equal to rate of accumulation loss inside of the control volume. And if we rearrange the dt from the right side of the equation to the left, and then integrate with respect to time, we have this formula that we can say at time t zero, we have some initial water level height. And so at the beginning, before the water level is dropping, we can measure h. And um, we can find out how long it's going to take, the amount of time, for it to fall from the initial height, h naught, to some other height, h. Now, I have to be very clear about something. H is not the distance that it falls. H is the height of the water above the center line of the orifice at time t. It's uh, the distance between the two. How far it <coughs> fell is H naught minus H. But H itself is a height. It's not how far it's fallen. Now, let's put that to use here in this problem where uh, we know the orifice opening is 15 centimeters and the initial height of the water surface is 2.5 meters and so H naught is 2.5 and uh, they've also given us the diameter of the tank as 500 millimeters and so that 500 millimeters is talking about this dimension here the the diameter of the tank and so from that we can find the cross-sectional area of the tank if you remember in our formula, we're going to have to equate the area of the tank and the area of the orifice. And I'll note, just to emphasize, that A1 is not under that square root sign. Uh, the square root is just 2g, but A1 is outside of the square root sign. So I'd like you to solve for two things. To emphasize the nonlinearity of outflow, First of all, calculate the amount of time it's going to take for the water level to fall 1.1 meters. Now be careful with the geometry here because remember what I said on the previous slide is h is not the fall distance but rather h is the elevation of the water above the uh, orifice at the uh, time t. Um, the, uh, let's see, the one last parameter I want to point out is that the initial height of 2.5 meters, that's talking about from the center line of the orifice up to the water surface before the water is falling. So at time t zero, t equals zero, then um, it's 2.5 meters. And so we want to find out how long does it take for it to fall 1.1 meters? And then in part b, how long does it take to fall an additional 1.1 meters? The nice thing about this is that from part A to part B, you know, the areas are the same. Uh, so this first part of the problem, if you look at when we start substituting the numbers in, this first component is really just about the ratio of the areas. It's the ratio of the uh, orifice area to the tank area. And then the, uh, the fall heights and the difference between them is in the second part of it. Um, 
So the interpretation is intentionally in this problem a little bit tricky to get you in the habit of really carefully looking at whether it's giving you a fall distance or the water height. This is like the kind of problem that you can expect to see a lot of on the FE because they're always looking for a, a problem that emphasizes a key principle and can be solved in three to four minutes is usually the, the goal that they have in mind. <laughs> And that's usually a really optimistic goal. To, to solve it in three minutes, you really have to be cooking along. Occasionally, there will be you know, like ethics questions or something that you can just solve instantly. But on average, they're going for three minutes per problem. So you know, this is kind of a characteristic problem. So two seconds to fall the, uh, the first increment. Why is it that when we calculate the second increment, it takes more time? It's the same 1.1 meter fall distance, so why does it take longer? Who can explain that? Yeah? There's less pressure to push the water out. All right. How are you going to put it? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, so if, if we think in terms of the outflow velocity, at the very beginning of this falling, when it was 2.5 meters of head, the velocity of the water squirting, squirting out was very fast. But as the water level gets lower and lower, the velocity, outflow velocity decreases. And so um, it takes longer to drain the same height, the same volume of water, essentially. So it takes longer time. Are there any questions related to this example before we keep moving? Yes? Good question. I, I think it's related to the material properties. You know, there probably is an upper velocity that's so high that it'll begin to uh, damage the material. We'll talk about one such case when we discuss cavitation today because um, when you have really high velocities, remember Bernoulli's equation tells us that a high fluid velocity means that there's a low pressure. And we'll talk about like the extreme high velocity, low pressure situation and what that can cause. That's actually a great question to tie in with where we're headed. Before we get to that, though, I wanted to remind you about differential manometers. It, uh, differential manometers and uh, piezometric pressure. Um, remember, the definition of piezometric pressure is the, uh, the pressure plus gamma times z. So P sub z is P plus gamma z. And the idea behind measuring piezometric pressure in a pipe that's experiencing energy loss due to pipe friction is that the piezometric pressure is going to, if it's an inclined pipe, only give us a, the difference in piezometric pressure would only indicate how much energy loss is due to um, pipe friction. Now, in a case like this, we're not considering pipe friction, but there is a velocity change due to the contracting section of the pipe. We have a nozzle where as the, uh, the gas is flowing upward, here because there's a larger cross section, the velocity is low. And then here, there is a smaller cross section, so the velocity is high. Now Bernoulli's equation tells us that when we have uh, an increase in fluid velocity, there should be a decrease in the pressure. And that's what we see in this differential manometer. We see, um, you know, if, the, if there was no wind going through this nozzle, then the water levels in the manometer would be equal. The fact that it's lower on the left leg tells us that there's more pressure at one than there is at two. In other words, the pressure at two is low, and so it's sort of like sucking the water up on the right leg of that manometer. So that kind of fits with what we know about uh, Bernoulli's equation, that you have areas of high velocity, that means lower pressure because of the exchange of energy that occurs. Now what we want to do here is find out for the velocity at one, 
being 30.48 meters per second, then what would be the, uh, number one, what, what's going to be the velocity at two based on this continuity relationship that we have in the first bullet point? And then how does that translate into the delta H that we should expect to see? Uh, so first of all, we can do some preliminary things here and uh, calculate the, uh, the unit weight of air based on the density that's given. All right, so the, um, the unit weight of air is going to be G times the density of air. So that's 9.81 meters per second squared multiplied by 1.03 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, so the unit weight of this is 10.104 newtons per meter cubed. And what we're assuming for this problem is that the air density is constant as it flows through the nozzle. In reality, it probably wouldn't be exactly constant because uh, air is compressible. But for now, we neglect that to get this estimation of the delta H that we could expect to see. We can apply the continuity relationship and say that inside of that nozzle, there's nowhere that the air can be stored. So the fluid that's flowing through, whatever comes in, has to go out. And so the way we're going to express that is that Q in is equal to Q out. Therefore, A1 V1 is equal to A2 V2. That's how we're going to solve for the velocity at location 2, is this ratio that the velocity at location 2 is A1 V1 divided by A2. So the uh, A1 from that first bullet point is 2 times A2. So let's substitute that in. 2 times A2 multiplied by the velocity at 1 divided by A2. Okay, so essentially that means that the, uh, the velocity at 1 that we're given, 30.48, we can put that in here, 30... 0.48 meters per second. So therefore, V2 is 60.96 meters per squared. And maybe we could have just figured that out by inspection, right? We didn't have to go to the trouble of all of the formulas. If the area is half at 2, that means the velocity is going to be double. Okay, And that's what it is. The velocity is double. Okay, now, we're going to put this into Bernoulli's. And uh, Bernoulli's equation, P1 plus gamma Z1 plus the density, velocity at 1 squared divided by 2, is equal to P2 plus gamma Z2 plus the density, the velocity at 2 squared divided by 2. And we remember that P sub Z is pressure plus gamma Z piezometric pressure definition. Um, so we can rearrange the equation. We can just call this P sub Z1, and we're going to call this P sub Z2, and we end up with P sub Z1 plus density velocity 1 squared divided by 2 is equal to PZ2 plus density, velocity, 2 squared divided by 2. Okay. So the difference in P sub Z delta P sub Z is the density divided by 2 and the difference in velocity squared. V2 squared minus V1 squared just by rearranging that so that we have PZ1 uh, minus PZ2. Yep, all right. So we can put in the, uh, the density of air, 1.03 kilograms per cubic meter, divided by 2. 
and uh, the velocity at location two, which we calculated from continuity, 60.96 meters per second. Square that, minus 30.48 meters per second. Square that. Okay. The uh, delta PZ should be 1435 newtons per meter squared. So that's the difference in piezometric pressure that we would expect just based on the differences in velocity and the density of the fluid in question, which is air. Now we can put that into the equation, the manometer equation. And in the manometer equation, um, we can rearrange it for delta H. So delta H is delta PZ divided by the gamma of the liquid minus the gamma of air. Okay, so the uh, 1435 newtons per meter squared divided by 15,710 newtons per meter cubed. And uh, that's just the given specific weight of whatever this manometer fluid is, minus the unit weight of air, which we calculated at the beginning. All right. So when we put it all together, we should expect that the delta H is 0 0.0914 meters. So that is kind of a uh, refresher of both the Bernoulli equation and the manometer equation, both of which are going to be included on our uh, next midterm exam. Remember that the uh, midterm exam, too, includes chapter 4, chapter 5, which we're finishing up today, and then chapter 6, which is momentum stuff, which will begin in class on Thursday. Do you have a question? Uh, it's because here the liquid is the manometer fluid. And in previous equations, what we'd say is, you know, it's the manometer fluid or the, the one that has the greater density minus the one that has less density. And that's essentially, this came from this uh, manometer equation is just the hydrostatic equation between location one and location two. That's where we've derived that previously. If, you know, where we say, let the um, where we would say uh, P2 and then minus I'm sorry plus the gamma of air times three meters you know that process of comparing the uh, the pressures between the two points and then rearranging it all right so now let's talk about that question that was raised earlier of what about a maximum velocity of, uh, you know, a liquid coming out of an orifice. And let's uh, refresh ourselves, refresh our memories of a slide we've seen before, this slide. Do you remember what this slide's depicting? Boiling water, vapor pressure, yeah, they're one and the same. This is one way to get water to go from the gas phase, I'm sorry, from the liquid phase to the gas phase is by heating it. And there's another way as well, which is where you reduce the pressure of the gas above the liquid until the liquid molecules can escape into the gas phase because there isn't pressure pushing down holding them. And so this is what we looked at before is the temperature dependency of vapor pressure and what we've seen is that most conditions we think of water boiling at 100 degrees Celsius because that's the standard atmospheric pressure. But depending the elevation that you're at, atmospheric pressure may be less than that. And so, for example, on the top of mountains, water will boil at a lower temperature than it will at sea level. But that's not the only way to get water to boil by raising the heat. We can also reduce the pressure. And here is a depiction of a contracting pipe section. So here at the throat is similar to what we did in the lab with the Venturi. 
and you've actually seen with your own eyes the uh, energy grade line and the hydraulic grade line when you did the graph of that. Um, the piezometric head here is what we saw from those piezometer tubes that were connected to the Venturi. Um, when the velocity going through the pipe is very low, then there isn't much of a pressure reduction. That's what this top dashed line is showing, is what if there was just very little flow going through here? And then the next one is what if we increase the velocity? When you increase the velocity, that means there's going to be a more extreme reduction in the pressure at the throat. Well, if we keep increasing the velocity high enough, then what happens is that the pressure becomes so low at that throat section that actually it can go below atmospheric pressure. Now, remember there's two ways to measure pressure. There's gauge pressure and there's absolute. You'll never get the pressure of the water to go below absolute zero. What I'm saying is that you can get it to go below atmospheric pressure. So below 101.325 pascals, if we're thinking in terms of absolute. So the pressure can go lower and lower and lower as the velocity increases. Now here's a zoomed in view of that throat section. As we continue to increase the velocity, little vapor bubbles can form. Because remember that when the pressure goes low, if it goes lower than the vapor pressure, then liquid is going into the gas phase. And so essentially you can say that the water is boiling in that throat section if the velocity is going fast enough. It's not heating up. The temperature is staying the same, but what happens is the pressure in this throat is so low that some of the liquid is, is bubbling into the vapor phase. So it, they're little, tiny, very microscopically small vapor pockets that as you move further through this section, the pressure is increasing again. Why is that? Why is it that the pressure is getting higher as we get out of the throat and further on down through the pipe? The velocity is slowing down, exactly right. So as the velocity starts to go lower, the pressure is going up again. So here we have all these little uh, vapor bubbles that used to have a low pressure around them, and so a vapor bubble can exist in that environment, but then it gets pushed downstream where the surrounding pressure is high, and it instantaneously collapses because of the pressure being high surrounding it. And uh, when it collapses, it can send a little shock wave through the, through the pipe. Let me skip ahead of this example just momentarily to show you some of the damage that it can cause. One of the locations that you see cavitation, in addition to a venturi throat, is uh, on the impeller of a pump. The way that a pump works is it accelerates water and increases the pressure on one side of the pump. But on the suction side of the pump, the pressure can be very low. And if you're not very cautious about the length of a suction pipe or how high above the water surface the pump is located, then cavitation, which is the, the formation of those little bubbles, cavitation can occur inside of a pump, and over time, it will basically, those little imploding vapor bubbles, send a shock wave through the metal and cause little pits to form. And, you know, each collapsing vapor bubble only sends a, a little bit of energy through the water, but over the long term and over hundreds of thousands and millions of those little implosions, it can really do a lot of damage. It's as though you were sending sand through your pump because of the scour that occurs. All right, so what we're always doing, and we'll come back to this in hydraulic engineering, is we're trying to make sure that we avoid cavitation because it can cause so much damage to uh, pipe systems and to pumps. What we want to do here is assess. We want to find out, is cavitation going to occur in this system? In other words, we have to solve for the pressure at location 2 using Bernoulli's equation and then compare that to the criteria that's here. The water flowing through the system is 60 degrees Celsius and so from that we look up the unit weight. We can also find the vapor pressure. 
If the pressure of the water inside the throat goes below the vapor pressure, then cavitation will occur. And uh, that's kind of a risky zone to be in. And so to the question of is there a maximum velocity, you need to be careful about achieving maximum velocities where the pressure goes so low that you could be potentially experiencing cavitation. And cavitation could occur in an orifice, although um, you know, an, an orifice is so narrow that that location of high velocity is, is pretty small. It's not the same kind of risk as you might have in a pipe like this, where there's more area to wear away if the cavitation occurs. So, to solve this example, what you need to do is find P2 using Bernoulli's equation, and then compare P2 to the vapor pressure that's given. So remember, Bernoulli's equation is about an exchange of energy. You're exchanging energy that used to be as uh, pressure into an increase in velocity. And so that's why the pressure at location two has to come down, is that you know, there's only so much energy in the system. And if you're going to be taking some of the pressure, and at location one, we have 84.4 meters of pressure head. And at location one, we have 20.4 meters of velocity head. So the total energy there, excluding elevation, which we are uh, ignoring since it's a horizontal system and Z1 equals Z2. So uh, 84.4 and 20.4, that's the, uh, the total energy at one. And we say that uh, because of the system being the way it is, we're going to have 103.2 meters of head existing as velocity. And so there's not much energy left over to go into the pressure. And so when we actually crunch the numbers, we find that the leftover energy is going to mean that the pressure at location 2 is only going to be 15 kilopascals. And the vapor pressure is 20 kilopascals. So our criteria here is that since the, uh, since the pressure is less than the, ca the vapor pressure, that means there will be cavitation. Now how much cavitation and for how long? You know, it could be just a temporary thing. And if it's fleeting, it may not cause serious structural damage to the pipe. But over the long term, it could cause that pipe to rupture. There could be... Uh, you know, a complete erosion of the system. And I'll show you pictures of a situation where it occurred in a really big way. Before we take a look at those pictures, any questions related to the calculations? Yes? I'm not sure about the gas pipeline news story. It's possible. It is possible. Are you talking about like down in Alabama? Yeah, outside Yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't heard too much about that the cause of it, just other than the headline that there was an explosion. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> it would be the same approach. We would be able to say Z1 equals Z2. So the elevation term would cancel out. We would put in the uh, known pressure at one. We would put in the velocities that are both known. And the only unknown would be the pressure at two. So I think we should get the same answer. Ah, uh, OK. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, the density, you'd have to divide the unit weight that's given by 9.81 to find the density. And what density did you use? 
982 kilograms per cubic meter. Great. Good. So I already showed you this picture of cavitation. I mean, you know, so what? A pump burns out, you get a new one. Um, but a dam burns out, you can't always get a new one very easily. And uh, back in the early 80s, there was a really wet spring. And I'm going to show you guys just how old I am. I was in Utah, which is where this was, in the spring of 1983. I remember that wet spring. So um, it was so wet that they had too much water going through the, uh, the lake, and they had to discharge a lot more than usual through the spillway. And so they had a situation where the velocities were very, very high through this penstock, through the, um, through the pipe that carries the flow from the reservoir to the river. And uh, there was a little bit of cavitation that occurred. And it actually scoured away all of the concrete that was lining that spillway. And it got down into the rock as well. Here's a picture of some guys. These are people standing on a ladder from where the pipe should be down to the bottom. They're sort of inspecting the, uh, the strength of the rock down there, trying to figure out if they can fill that in with concrete and reinforce it. Um, because the velocities were so high for so long, it was either let the water spill over the top of the dam or try and get more than the usual amount through that overflow spillway. Now, they've had droughts, and they haven't really had another wet spring quite like they did that year. But they also found that they could prevent the damage associated with cavitation by injecting air. Um, putting in vents. If they inject a, a thin stream of air upstream of where that cavitation would occur, then sort of the water is riding on a cushion of air, and it's not actually in physical contact with the, uh, in physical contact with the concrete. So it's, it's another way that they sort of protect really expensive critical infrastructure is through that air cushion injection method. Yeah. All right. Key ideas on the homework. We haven't talked about rocket motors. So occasionally, like a student will see an unfamiliar homework problem. They'll, they'll see that there's a problem related to rocket motors, and they'll say, I can't do this. We never talked about rocket motors. But of course, uh, it doesn't really matter what the application is. It's that we have the, uh, the underlying fundamentals that are in play here. And uh, it is continuity relationship, Reynolds transport theorem, you know, control volumes, control surfaces. So let me help you interpret what's going on in this rocket. This is a solid rocket. Uh, the, the propellant is a solid that as it burns, that surface is retreating. And then the solid turns into a gas. And the gas is, um, as it passes through this narrowed down throat section where the diameter of the throat is small, it increases the velocity, and ultimately the discharge um, opening has a diameter of 8 centimeters. And so there's these gases coming out. This is asking, what's the velocity of the gas that comes out of the rocket motor? And you'll use stuff like that in chapter 6 to calculate how much force the rocket is able to, you know, like the, the pounds of thrust or the newtons of thrust that can be generated by the rocket. But what you need to do is start off with some of the other given information. They tell you the pressure of the gas as it exits the rocket, the temperature, and the R value, which is the, uh, the gas law constant for the gas that's coming out of there. You're going to use that information to calculate the density of the gas. They're also telling you the density of the propellant that's burning because this is um, a Reynolds transport theorem where we have an accumulation of mass. You know, the mass that's burning, this solid rocket fuel, as it burns, the same amount of mass is going out the end of the rocket. So the mass loss in the accumulation is equal to the mass flow out through the opening of the motor. So you can see I've just drawn a little control volume here. We put the rocket inside of the control volume. The gas goes out, and we have a loss of accumulation. So the dm inside the control volume versus time is going to be negative. We're losing mass at a certain rate. You can find the volume that's being lost every second. 
because you know the diameter, this is circular. You know the cross-sectional area of the motor, how quickly that surface re is retreating, then you could calculate how many cubic meters per second of the solid propellant is being burned. And you know the density of the propellant, and so you can find out how many kilograms per second of this solid are burning. And that's the same number of kilograms per second that's coming out. We also have this definition of mass flow rate. Remember, you calculated kilograms per second that it's coming out. Well, if you know the density of the gas, then that will enable you to find the velocity, which is what the problem is asking you, find the velocity. So how do you know the density of the gas? We have this from way back in chapter two, where we use the ideal gas law to calculate the density of a gas with the pressure, the R value, and the temperature. Now, you don't need to do any conversions to the R value. This is already the form that it needs to be used. But you do have to convert the given pressure from kilopascals into pascals, or newtons per meter squared. What about the temperature? What are you going to have to do with that temperature before you can put it into the density formula? Kelvin. Kelvin. Right. Very good. So that gives you some idea on what direction to head for this problem. The main idea here is just you're losing mass in the motor, and that's the same amount of mass that's coming out as a vapor through the discharge nozzle. All right? Here's the, uh, the last problem I want to give you some key idea about. You can think of this as like a uh, syringe. Someone is pushing on the outside end of the syringe with a force, and that force is pushing the water through an opening. And I added these little squiggles here to emphasize the fact that this is discharging into the surrounding air. What happens to a water jet when it is touching air? What happens to the pressure of a water jet when it's surrounded on all sides by air? Zero pressure. So the pressure of that water jet is zero. Is the pressure of the water inside the nozzle zero? No, it still has some pressure. We don't know yet, but once it comes out, it's zero. What you can do is uh, the piston is moving at six feet per second, and they tell you the diameter of this main shaft and the diameter of the throat of the nozzle. So since you know how quickly it's moving and you can calculate the cross-sectional area, you can find out the volume that water's coming out. You can turn that into a volumetric flow rate and find the vo velocity of discharge. So you can find out, like, what's the speed of the water that's squirting out of that nozzle. Um, and use Bernoulli's equation. Remember, we like to apply Bernoulli's equation at places where we know things. And so, if you were to say, in a problem like this, uh, let's pick location one and location two strategically, so that as much stuff cancels out as possible. Let's say that um, here's location one and here's location two. So what's the advantage of choosing those two spots like I have in terms of Bernoulli's equation? Z1 and Z2 cancel out. Okay, so that's part of it. Z1 is equal to Z2. What else is nice? P2. What do we know about P2? All right. So it's looking pretty good so far. Uh, velocities. How are we going to characterize the velocities? Okay, so the velocity at one, the water velocity there is just, it's moving at the same speed as the piston. So the piston is moving, all of the water in that segment is going the same speed. And what about V2? How do we find that? V1A1 is equal to V2A2, so continuity, right? So here, from the two inches, you can get A2. From this, you could get A1. So V piston is given. We need to find out what is V2. That is 
the velocity of discharge. They ask you to find two things in this problem. The first part is the velocity, which you're going to calculate using Bernoulli's equation. The last part is the definition of force. Force is pressure times area. So you're going to know the water pressure inside of here using Bernoulli's equation. We know that uh, P1 is, uh, P2 is zero, but you're going to find the pressure inside here. And then you know the area over which the force is being applied. I'll get out of your picture here. So you can find the force that's being applied by the piston just by the area of that piston and the pressure inside of the nozzle. So I hope that helps. Remember, it's a quick turnaround on this one just to avoid the uh, lengthy all-at-once assignment. But you're engineers, you're used to it, right? Used to being abused, that's sort of how it goes. See you on Thursday.